Basball fail. How do our experts view England's epic loss? And we take a look back at some of the boldest Basball claims. Is Annabelle Sutherland on track to become Australia's greatest female test player? Plus, we look ahead to Australia's tour of New Zealand as Kane Williamson and Steve Smith go toe to toe. Let's go around the wicket. Uh, you had a bit of a colourful relationship with Kiwi Crows. I guess, what does it mean to you to play in New Zealand? Yeah, I enjoy playing here. Um, you know, for me, it's about coming out and trying to put my best foot forward and score runs. Um, the crowd, yeah, they got personal, but if they have to get personal, that's their character. It's not. It's, I, I just go about my business, but that's upon each individual. If that's what they feel like they have to do, then so be it. You know, if you want to pay your money to come and abuse people, then you know, you have to go back and lay in your own bed. We get to play the game of cricket that we love, enjoy, and try and put bums on seats to keep the game um, going. Davey Warner has set the scene and he's not going out <laughs> quietly. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Around the Wicket. I'm Narrowly Meadows. Callum Ferguson and Aaron Finch alongside me. Finchie is a great mate of yours. He set the tone and I feel like there's going to be a bit of spice and maybe a bit of interaction with the crowd. He doesn't care. <laughs> he, he loves the attention on him. Um, whether the crowd are aggressive, they're personal, he's seen it all before. So he'll just get out there, he'll try and smack a few about and he'll be happy. Do you think the crowd can sleep at night? <laughs> oh, I'm sure they're sleeping fine. Especially I, after a few beers. I, absolutely, and there'll be a few of those. But he just doesn't let us down in front of the cameras these days and in front of the journos. He doesn't let anyone get away with anything, but particularly the crowds. He'll be keeping receipts, as he always has. Oh, he's got plenty of receipts, there's no doubt about that. The T20 internationals are coming up. Now, they're important because they're the last ones that we've got before the T20 World Cup. So, yes, a lot of these guys will be playing in the IPL as well, but as the former skipper at the last T20 World Cup, is there one area that you want to see Australia hone in on to make sure they get absolutely right in New Zealand? Oh, I think the selection needs a little bit of continuity now. As, as you get closer to the tournament, you need to start to work out exactly what your best 11 is going into the first game of the World Cup. And I think Australia will do that. The, yes, it's about giving guys an, enough opportunity to make sure that they're ready for it. But at the same time, in your mind, you, you need to make sure that you've got that 11 bettered down. And then when you get the chance, um, it, it's just about making, the, making sure the guys go out and play. How important are these T20s? Oh, enormously. I think what we've seen Australia do really well for a long period of time in the run into major tournaments is give guys opportunities in different spots. You never know. Injuries can happen leading into a big tournament. And Australia's always been, I think, in the last three, four years, the best prepared team to handle a crisis like that. Injuries moving into different spots. Players have already got their positions down pat, but they've also got secondary positions that they can have an impact from. And I think what's so important is Australia have tactically been the best side uh, particularly in the 50-over World Cup, they knew what they wanted to achieve. They didn't let any of the outside noise worry them when mm. they went 0-2 in the first two games of the World Cup, and they've been on a great run ever since. So I think that that side of it will be fine. I think then it's just making sure that the 11 is is set to go. Three T20 internationals and then two tests in New Zealand. That's what we've got to look forward to. The women have just played a one-off test at the WACA. It was comprehensive, <laughs> yes. shall we say. Elisa Healy's uh, team ended up winning by an innings and 284 runs, 99 and out for Elisa Healy, unfortunately. Didn't quite bring up the tonne. But Annabelle Sutherland, a double tonne, how good is she going to be? She's just 22 years of age and, by the way, picked up five wickets as well. Yeah, that's the thing. She's an all-round package and, and she's a great athlete in the field. So she offers the team so much. But she could be our greatest ever, I believe. The fact that she's got a double tonne to her name already, she's got another 100 on top of that already as well and she's such a threat with the ball. She really does have the potential to be the best we've ever had and the world's potentially ever seen. That's a big call. When, it is. When you look at Elise Perry, she's been... Probably the benchmark of all-rounders, particularly yeah. for such a long time. Meg Lanning, one of the greats. Belinda Clark, Karen Rolton, all the names that have gone before as well. So it's a big call for her, but I'm, I'm with you on this one. She just seems to have the temperament, though. Yeah. And as we know now, all the girls that are coming through are getting the right backing, the right development. We didn't have it when I was a kid. <laughs> no. So these kind of women who have the talent, they also now have the backing and, and as I say, that development. So... 
Let's wait and see, but oh my word, what a weekend it was for Will Sutherland and Annabelle Sutherland. Just quietly, if you were skipper in a, a Shield match, a Test match, 43-degree heat, you win the toss and you send your bowling <laughs> oh. attack in to oh, do the damage. But there's a part of you that inside of you just dies a little bit. When <laughs> yes. the, the coin goes up, could you see that your captain goes straight to the microphone and you think, right, we've won the toss, we're batted. And she says bowling, <laughs> devastated, but justified. Bowling, South Africa out for 76 is extraordinary. 43 degree heat in Perth. Well done to the women. It was great to see them get back on the winner's list in the test form of the game. Don't go anywhere and around the wicket. We're going to be joined by another former test captain in Michael Clark. He's going to talk about that big buzz ball loss. You, know, you look at his stats at the moment, they're outrageous. Uh, but yeah, he's such a lovely guy. Um, you know, I get along with him really, really well. Um, we're, we're chalk and cheese, but we, um, we're, we're, you know, we enjoy each other's company. And, you know, he's been a, such a great um, player for New Zealand for all these, all these years. And I hopefully he keeps continuing. Kane Williamson is in some sort of form, there's no doubt about it. The T20s first, but then the all-important two tests. Michael Clark joins us now, as always, on Around the Wicket. Pup, he had an extraordinary series, yes, against an undermanned South Australia, but averaging 134 and basically pulling off that victory when South, uh, South Africa were, were really pushing there. Can you just put into words the importance of Kane Williamson to this New Zealand team and how big a threat he's going to be to Australia? Uh, yeah, he's a brilliant player. He's in the top five test players currently and has been for a long time, I reckon, um, in regards to batting. He bats in a very important position. Senior player in their team. Uh, walked away from the captaincy a few years ago now so he could focus uh, on his batting and his record's phenomenal. And certainly over the past couple of years, it's been outstanding. So, yeah, I think he's a big wicket for the Aussies. Um, he's there, yeah, he's their best batsman, most experienced. And I think for New Zealand to, to have a chance at beating Australia, Kane's form's going to need to continue. And I think the other thing is, yes, he's been successful all around the world, but he knows the New Zealand conditions really well. He's probably at his best, like a lot of batsmen, in their own backyard. So, yeah, hopefully the Aussies can find a way to uh, attack him early um, and they'll be looking to get him out early as well. And, yes, it is an undermanned South Africa, not quite a South Australia, though, as <laughs> yeah. I just said. But on that point of the conditions, Finchie, you feel like if he was playing more often in Australia, he'd have even more tonnes than he does, which stands at 32 at the moment. Oh, it, he was, it daps everywhere. His record all around the world is extraordinary. I think what actually sets him apart in the New Zealand conditions, where the wickets are a little bit slower, yes, they see him and they swing a lot, but he plays so late, he plays, he doesn't push at the ball. So the fact that he that his hands are laid, his bat angle is really good, allows the ball to move and he doesn't push out in front and nick the ball like a lot of players who go to conditions like those, they do. It sounds a bit funny, but is he underrated? Absolutely. I think he's right up there with he's New Zealand's greatest ever player. And I think if you look at his ability throughout history to play all around the world, he, he's as good as anyone who's who's played in the last uh, last decade or so. You made a really good point there about the technical side of his game. It's actually, he's quite re well, he's quite efficient with the way he plays so side on and late. And there are a couple of issues that the Australian players were actually battling with during the Australian summer. So maybe they might get a really close up look at someone who does play late, play side on, and is able to handle those sideways moving conditions. Pup, the battle within the battle. Steve Smith and Kane Williamson are both now on 32 tonnes. Whoever gets there first will crack the top 10 going past Alistair Cook, who has 33 tonnes, but in a little bit longer time it took him. Do you think that that's something that might spur Smithy on a little bit? Not at all. <laughs> I think they'll both have uh, at least 33 by the end of the series, maybe 34. Um, I don't think either of them are chasing personal milestones, um, but it shows their dominance. There's no doubt about it. I think uh, Smitty's got that extra uh, pressure, expectation from within because he's now batting in a position where uh, it's a new challenge for him and, and he wanted that challenge. So he's got a lot already within that, you know, that hunger will be burning for him to continue to stand up and be the player he's been for his entire career. 
uh, but now in a different position, opening the batting. And Kane will know that if New Zealand had got any chance of beating Australia, he's probably going to have to be the leading run scorer in the series for them to do that. Um, he goes into this series now with good form, and I think that's important against a very good Australian attack. I think Kane being at his best, he's still going to be challenged by these Australian bowlers, but... Um, they're going to have to execute well because he is in good nick. He is confident. He's moving his feet well. You know, when Kane and Smitty, both of them, when they're at their best, they're very balanced just before they hit the ball. And, again, yes, they play different. They have different techniques, different styles. They, they've grown up on different pitches. But the, the key to their success is how still they are when they're defending, when they're playing their shots, when they're letting the ball go. And at the moment you can see with Kane – He's blocking the ball no matter how far someone bowls and his, his feet actually don't move after he hits the ball because he's so still and so balanced and that's a really important sign as a batsman. You know you're batting well when that's happening. That's a tantalising prospect watching two of the modern day greats, one, two of the legends of all time really going head to head. It's a pity it's only two tests. But the only other active player with 30 test tonnes or more was out uh, going for a reverse scoop the other day. England all out for 122 in an emphatic loss <laughs> to India to go down 2-1 so far in this series. What do you think about Basball and the situation and that result, Pup? Uh, they're copying some criticism from uh, their home media. Um, I think it's one of those things. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. I think Ben Stokes and Brendan McCullum have made it clear this is how they want this England team to play. Um, I think from inside the camp, they, you know, they'll be thinking, well, you know, the media was standing and applauding when Joe Root was doing it to Pat Cummins but now they're criticising him as it's the worst shot to ever be played by an English test batsman. So, you know, welcome to playing sport at the highest level. Welcome to dealing with media. Uh, the pros and cons love you when they want to and criticise you when they, you know, when they get an opportunity. So I think this is important, though, for England to really come together as a group. If this, call it basball, whatever you want to call it, if this is what they believe in, then this is the time where you've got to come out and keep backing yourselves and not care what other people say or think. If you think this is the best chance of beating India in this test series, then, you know, back yourself and play that way. But, yeah, it, it's, it was always going to be the case. It's, when you're playing um, in any sport, if you're taking more risks, then you've got to understand there's going to there's gonna be some failures. But I think for someone like Joe Root, his record's phenomenal. Um, that's probably why it's such a big talking point as well because people are saying, does Joe need to... Um, play these type of shots or does he need to adapt to basball? Can he not just keep playing the same way? But, you know, to team sport, if it's one if one of them are in, then then I'm, I'd imagine Ben Stokes will want them all to be in. So they're copying their criticism. They're under some pressure. They're behind in the series. It's going to be interesting to see what happens in the fourth test. I just think that there needs to be a little bit of game awareness there. Yeah. Yes, that's one thing. Because what they've been doing is getting so far ahead in games and that they score so fast, they put so much pressure on the opposition without doing anything. That's just their intent that yeah. makes the opposition standoffish. If they had the ability at the moment, and, and we've seen it at different times, just game awareness, maybe for a session, just swallow your pride, just hold back a little bit, get the get the game back on your terms, which, which they often do, then then it's going to be so hard to stop because their openers are getting so many runs and laying a platform, they're just not capitalising on it. It's a really good point you make. Ben Stokes is actually one of the better exponents of it because he's obviously had a big hand in it, but he doesn't walk out there and try and blast away from ball one very often at all. The other guys around him do, but he doesn't. Joe's probably just trying to strike that balance. It's a, it's a significantly different game style to what he's played his whole career. So I would look at the last few years and actually say he's adjusted pretty well. He's probably just every now and then not quite getting it right, but who gets it right every time? Is the nature of the loss a bit of a wake-up call, do you think, Ferg? Do they need to assess it a little? Oh, look, I, I would, if I was in that dressing room, want them to not view it as anything more than a blip on the radar because it's the first time they've been bowled out in 13 tests under 230. Now, they did that almost every second innings for the previous 12, uh, 12 tests, I believe it was. So I, I've, I feel like it's made a significant change in their fortunes and I think they've just got to not view it any more than a blip. They're heading in the right direction. They're in India. It's not always going to go your way. 
Basball in general, though, has given up quite a few headlines and I think the world of cricket has quite enjoyed it along the way. The latest one is from Ben Duckett. Now, Pup, he said that England should take some credit for the way that Jaswal is playing and no-one has scored more runs in this round of World Test Championship than Jaswal. He's yeah. been a phenomenon. Do you think England should be taking a little bit of credit for that? He's basically <laughs> saying that we're playing Test cricket in a certain way and it's encouraging others to do it too. <laughs> he must have missed Australia for about 20 years then. As a youngster, he must not watch Australia play <laughs> Test cricket. Has he, has he heard of math? Matthew Hayden, Michael Slater, Ricky Ponting, <laughs> Damien Martin, Adam Gilchrist. <laughs> Man, these guys used to smack it as good as anyone. So because you play a reverse sweep right. or a switch hit or a ramp shot, that doesn't mean you're batting aggressively either. Matthew Hayden just walked down the wicket and hit it straight over your head for six. He didn't have to play a ramp or a switch hit. So... I don't know. Look, <laughs> I, I love the way that they, I love the way they are playing. I love aggressive, positive cricket in any format. And now, because of 2020 cricket, we're seeing different shots. We're seeing players play the full 360 in all three formats. You didn't see that as much in Test cricket. You wouldn't see, you know, if somebody bowled a bouncer, you would 90% of the time you'd see a hook shot or a pull shot. 10% of the time you'd see someone ramp it over slips. But you know, so you're seeing different shots, but you're not seeing more aggression or more positivity. I, I, I can tell you a number of innings I was lucky enough to, to bat with one of those superstars. And once they got to 20, 30, 40, if they wanted to, they, they could have stroked it. They could, they could have went 7, 10, 15 runs and over, whatever they wanted to. It was, it was about building an innings to get the team into a position, you know, finding a bowler that you felt most comfortable with and taking it to him. You know, Matthew Hayden, the way he swept Harbhajan Singh in, through that 2001 series, so aggressive, so positive, but it was a genuine sweep shot. It wasn't a reverse. So, I don't know. I, I, I love the aggressive approach from England. I think it has worked. I think they're building a really good foundation to play great cricket. They're getting the results they want. They did it in this test match, but... Playing in India is tough, so you can sit there and block. You're going to get one with your name on it. You can try and play a reverse sweep and you might hit it straight to backward point. That, that's just the way the game goes. But I, I think, yeah, I think people need to be realistic and understand that as a batsman, your job is to score runs and there's been plenty of great players and plenty of teams around the world score plenty of runs against uh, good opposition. England's not the first team to, to play aggressive or, or bat positively. I love it. Pup is fired out, fired up. But just to round all this off, I just want to go through some of the big Baz Ball calls that we've had over the last couple of yes. years. So Paul Collingwood in June 2023, we are trying to make Test cricket a lot more entertaining. If we don't do that, then Test cricket might not survive. Our vision as a Test team is far greater than results. Ollie Robinson, this was a good one in June 2023. Baz said after the game, it feels like we've won, lads. We've entertained the world and we've put the Aussies on the back foot. Harry Brook, this is a famous mm, one. Yes. It's part of the Aussie Sheds vernacular now in July 2023. If we can win this week, it almost can make it a moral victory. And then Ben Duckett, as we just said, February 2024, when you see players like Juswell from the opposition playing like that, it almost feels like we should take some credit that they're playing differently than how other people play test cricket. Bless Basball. Oh. It's the gift that keeps on giving, Ferg. Have a listen and read all that. Oh it's extraordinary, God. really. All of that's been said out of the same camp. Oh, I'm hearing you, pup. It's extraordinary to think that... They can stand in front of a camera and take themselves... Sit. They've got to be mewling us, don't they? Look, we are four Aussies sitting here. I will say, since McCullum took over, 21 tests, 14 wins, six losses, one draw, yet to lose a series. They go at 4.71 runs per over, a batting average of 37, which is better than the Aussies. Uh, so in that period, Australia have been about on par but won the World Test Championship along the way as well. So, look, the results there, we're having a bit of fun. Yep. We need it. We love the conversation. Pup, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week after the T20 International. Thanks, guys. Don't go anywhere on Around the Wicket. After this short break, we're going to check out the action across the Shield cricket because there's plenty of tons and a few ducks along the way.
Welcome back to Around the Wicket. We need to chat a little bit of Shield cricket because there was plenty going on in the last few days. A bit of a surprise, Jake Fraser McGurk was selected to open for South Australia. It didn't go well, a duck and a one. Do you like the idea of it though? No, I don't. I think uh, <laughs> batting at six, he's found his niche there. I think how aggressive he plays is suited to that position, gives him the opportunity to get in and take on the old ball, do some real damage. If he happens to bat against the second new, he's also very competent, but... I don't like it. I think just leave him at number six, let him forge his career, continue to keep improving, and then maybe 18 months' time when, when he's created a really good case for himself, then you can look at shifting him up the order. But I think he, he plays a little bit too high risk for the top of the order in shield cricket and just leave him where he is. Yeah, I tend to agree, and particularly with the nature of a lot of the wickets around the country at the yeah. moment being quite spiced up and, and green at times, particularly early in the games. Adelaide Oval is one of those wickets that does seem around most of the games. So that was an interesting decision for mine too. Renshaw also struggled. Sorry, are you having a crack at Dizzy there for doing it? <laughs> There's an interesting decision it was, and there would have been a team of selectors that make that call. Oh, only you up to. <laughs> Renshaw was another one who, he's not in the best of form. 8 and 14, an average of 25 this Shield season. We know he's going to New Zealand. He's been selected in that squad to be the backup batter. But there's plenty of other players that are in better form than him at the moment. They're clearly not going to change that decision, but is it the right call? Should they be picking a, a form batter? Yeah, I've changed my mind on this. I think when the debate was up between Han uh, sorry Bancroft and Renshaw, I, I said the versatility of Renshaw. But, I mean, averaging 25 for the season is probably not good enough at, at this stage. Bancroft coming off another 100. And then you've got some other players around the country who are, who are manning some really good cases as well. Peter Hanscom, Nick Maddinson, uh, they're all getting the job done. Oh, Nick Maddinson for mine. If we're talking about flexibility, he's got the ability, and I am going to talk up a, a Victorian here. Very rare from a South Australian. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, very unbiased. But uh, Maddo has been playing really well for a long period of time. Yes, he's coming back for an ACL, which is, takes a lot of professionalism, a lot of dedication. I've been there myself. It's not easy to miss a huge chunk of your career like that. He's come back and batted beautifully from ball one. Nothing's changed on the red ball front for Nick Maddinson. And he's a one-to-five player. He's batted everywhere in the top order throughout his career at New South Wales and now Victoria. He's in wonderful form. He's, he's mounting every bit as good a case as anyone else in the country. And sometimes people can confuse big bash numbers as well because yes. they see yeah. such a big chunk of big bash. And he, didn't have, he hasn't had the best couple of years in, in that format. So people then assume that he's not getting the job done. Uh, in Shield cricket, but, but the last two games, a couple of hundreds, averaging 233. Oh, sorry, averaging 77 at 233 runs. That's a pretty good start, Bert. Yeah, no, he's been phenomenal. Before Bancroft got that third ton, as you said, Nick Maddinson in two matches has got as many tons as anyone else had got for the entire Shield mm. season. Is his test career over, or do you think he should absolutely still be in the mix? He should definitely still be in the mix. You know, age is no barrier. He's not old enough to be worried about that. He's batting beautifully, and he's batting... Same as Cam Bancroft, in a period of time where it's been very difficult for top-order players, the numbers suggest that this decade's been a lot harder than perhaps the two before it. So I would suggest he should be well in, well in the mix to head um, you know, to the selection table over the next six to 12 months and potentially make a, and forge a comeback. The other one I wanted to bring up was a great story, and it is Will Pekofsky. We, we brought mm. up his name a couple of shows ago and the concerns over the latest head knock, but for him to bring up his first 100 since the end of 2020, it puts a smile on your face, doesn't it? Oh, it certainly does, and I think everyone's happy to see him back playing cricket and, and getting the job done, particularly against New South Wales, which yeah. the Vicks weren't able to get across the line with a, with a bit of uh, weather hampering them. But, I mean, we've seen how good Will is, and... He's had to have a lot of resilience to get back to be to playing again. He's, he's had a couple of head knocks which, which caused some issues for quite a long time. So I just hope that he gets a really good run at it, whether he finishes out this year really strong and then and then has another year before he's considered for selection for Australia. But super talent, super player. Well done, Will Pekoski. Don't go anywhere on Around the Wicket because after this short break, we're going to take on the short stuff. Welcome to The Short Stuff. We start with DRS because Ben Stokes thinks umpire's call should be scrapped. Fergie, what do you think? No, don't scrap it. They're just a bit bitter about it. one decision that went <laughs> against them. I'm not having it. I think it should be scrapped. I, I think that you need to get the technology to a point where it's good enough or you don't use it at all. I think having, having the same decision that can be both out and not out and they're both right is, is ridiculous. 
Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. I'll tell you what, I've been the beneficiary be of a few umpires calls in my day. This will be good. But well, now yes. I'm retired, I could comfortably <laughs> say that umpires calls should be scrapped. I'm glad you said it because it was on the tip of my tongue. <laughs> the end of Bell Reeve Oval may be near. I'm shattered about this article that's come out in the last couple of days. Surely we don't want to lose Bell Reeve Oval. No, love Bell Reeve Oval. I think it's one of the great places to play. Yeah, it's a bit cold, but I like that. Um, <laughs> if, if they're talking about purchasing something else to build another high performance centre. I think they've got everything that they need there. I mean, from a player's point of view, yes, the practice wickets need a bit of a, a refresh. It's yes. not the easiest place to practice or prepare for a game, but I mean, the change rooms, everything, the whole feel of the ground, the, the, the I guess, almost country feel to yeah. it. The, the spectators are... Carnival-type yeah, atmosphere. It's, it's a brilliant place to play cricket. I love it, and I hate the fact that... That's on the table. And it's iconic as well. Yeah. It's like Durham Charla. It's like in Cape Town, those beautiful views. It's mm. just so beautifully Bell Reef. Yeah, and the surface is great too. There's always been a contest there between bat and ball, yeah. I've felt. Whilst it's been tricky for batting at times, then once it flattens out, great to bat on. Uh, across formats too. So, look, mm. it's not like they pack it out every time there's a cricket game on either. I'm not sure what their, their aim is. Are they trying to build a bigger stadium to to not pack that out. I think it's got a great atmosphere how it is, like Finchie said. Speaking of great Tasmanians, Ricky Ponting believes there should be a cap on the number of franchises that a, a player can play for. As somebody who's played in a lot of T20 <laughs> leagues around the world, <laughs> pretty much every single IPL team there Thanks. has ever been, uh, what do you think about this? Uh, I don't agree with it. I think that guys should be able to freely choose where they want to play and what formats they want to play. I think it, that, that if you start putting restrictions on players then they'll probably just start playing less anyway. So I think just keep the best players playing, whether it's test cricket, ODI or, or international cricket or whether it's franchise, I think it's still important to have the best players available. Finally, David Warner would like to see a New Zealand team in the Big Bash League. What do you reckon, Ferg? Oh, look, I, just if you were just having one team, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. I think if you were, you could go North and South Island maybe, have a couple of teams in. Because I think it's, it's almost a bit condescending. Oh, yeah, you could put one team into our competition. Yeah, we're that much better than them. I'm not sure I'm, I'm in for that. I think two teams from New Zealand. Love it. Thanks for your company on Around the Wicket. We'll see you next week.